Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much to my team who's supporting me up front. Uh, my name is Corinne Alpers. Uh, I'm a product manager on the Apollo Core platform team. And today I'm going to talk about one of our most exciting releases this year, our introduction of native support for federated subscriptions in GraphOS. Uh, this project is the result of dedicated, brilliant work from essentially each engineering team within Apollo, uh, ranging from our core teams or the Apollo router, the Federation side, as well as our client teams and Apollo Studio developers. I was fortunate to take the helm as product manager uh, for this effort, and I'm so proud of what we delivered and what we'll continue to do. So with that, I'm excited to talk to you today about what we delivered and why. All right, today's session is a quick one, but here's what we'll cover. First, we'll briefly review what real-time data is and why it's important for your applications and for your products. Uh, then I'll go over what GraphQL subscriptions are and how they relate to real-time use cases. And most importantly, we'll talk about federated GraphQL subscriptions, our design goals and how they informed our solution, and why the support goes beyond standard GraphQL subscriptions. So let's dive in. Okay, so first, what exactly is real-time data? When we're talking about real-time data, we're referring to information that is generated uh, processed and then made available for consumption and display immediately or in real time. So in the context of real time, we often refer to data or information as an event, which is essentially a discrete piece of data that, uh, or a change in state that's important enough to be recorded and then streamed in. For example, if I go ahead and like someone's post or their picture, that's recorded as an event, and then I can see the impact of the, my change directly on the screen. I can see the like count go up. Uh, that's a very, very simple use case of how real-time data is built into so many of our uh, products, so many of our applications. Um, it's a relevant part of our lives. But what are other examples of real-time features in applications? Okay, a pretty common use case for real-time functionality is in-app chat for things like support or even if you're watching something being streamed and you see, you see all these people commenting in the chat. When you're reviewing the chat, obviously you want to see new messages come in exactly as they're submitted. You don't want to see any delays. Uh, if you go ahead and post a message, you want to see it immediately displayed, uh, rather than needing to refresh the page or experience any kind of latency. Similarly, we're seeing more and more real-time updates integrated into applications to show things like the status of a meal delivery or ride share. So uh, you'll see a screenshot of the Uber Eats app on this page. Uh, it allows users to understand the status of an order, uh, including the various phases of a meal being created, picked up, as well as any delays. And then lastly, collaboration tools such as Figma or Google Docs also depend on real-time data to ensure users uh, don't accidentally overwrite each other's actions. You could have multiple people on the same screen. Obviously, if you're dragging a box around, you don't want someone else to be doing it at the same time and then not really sure of what you're doing, some race condition problems. Uh, you wanna see the changes reflected in the UI exactly as they occur. So if you're moving something and you don't see it moved until five seconds after, that's a pretty poor experience. Okay, so we went over a lot of things that we, we see in our daily lives, but why is real-time data valuable in our applications? Why are they valuable for our users and our products? Um, weird topic change, but follow me. Is anyone here familiar with Domino's Pizza? Okay, so a few people. More people should try it. It's great. <laughs> um, in 2008, they launched a pizza tracker uh, to show customers what phase of the cooking process their pizza in. So you could see the orders placed. You could see it in the prep phase. Um, it's baking. They're doing a quality check, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to use this example to outline the different benefits of uh, real-time data in applications. So firstly, incorporating real-time data into your product greatly improves the user experience as it makes the applications more responsive, they're more engaging, and they're more relevant to the user. Um, so let's consider Domino's Pizza Tracker. This tracker was actually a really big game changer for Domino's uh, because customers were accustomed to calling in and then waiting for 45 minutes or so, and if they had any questions about, did they forget my pizza? Um, what's the status, they had to go ahead and actually call Domino's. And so you might have an influx of tons of people calling in, uh, obviously clogging up the phone lines, and then also users just had no idea if uh, the pizza was coming. So 
they created this pizza tracker to be more transparent and to also, I think, relieve a lot of their operations. Uh, they were creating this new experience that was far more transparent to customers. It was a huge success and it reduced a lot of customers' anxiety. So they get to watch the status change on their pizza in real time, uh, builds up anticipation for their pizza, and also allows Domino's to portray their service as well-run, high quality, when they're probably in the kitchen just moving really, really fast. Um, another really important benefit of real-time data and features is the impact on operational efficiency. So I touched on this a little bit, but because customers receive live updates about their pizza status, they're no longer calling Domino's, they're no longer um, ha requiring staff to go ahead and pick up the phone, check on the status, relay it back to them, da da da, and then that, that takes so much employee time. Um, and Domino's actually reported after they launched this that the pizza tracker streamlined their own operations because the orders were now better processed and tracked, and if there were mistakes, they immediately knew where. Um, it really just reduced the amount of missed orders. Um, it, was, it was a great success for them. And lastly, adding real-time features for products give businesses a competitive advantage. So in Domino's case, uh, the ability to order online and view the status of orders really transformed their business, even in a time that uh, pizza businesses weren't doing particularly well. Um, in the first, first quarter after the site was launched, same-store sales went up by 14.3%, and many online pizza services, or even in-person services, have incorporated their own live tracking features in order to keep up Okay, so now we know what real-time data is and why it's valuable. So what are GraphQL subscriptions and how do they relate to real-time data? Subscriptions are a core feature and the third operation type within the GraphQL specification and are used to push real-time updates to clients as soon as they occur on the server. So subscriptions are similar to queries in that they allow you to specify a set of fields that you want delivered to the client. But unlike queries, a single answer isn't immediately returned. Rather, an active connection is opened uh, a result is sent to the client each time that event takes place. Uh, on the client side, this is achieved by opening a long-lived connection to the server and sending a subscription query, uh, which specifies the fields that the client would like to subscribe to, meaning that when that data changes on the server, those updates should be directly pushed to the clients. In this example on the screen, the client wants to know about when a mess new message is created. So each time that that occurs, uh, the server will push the content and the username directly to the UI. All right, so let's dive a little deeper and talk about how standard GraphQL subscriptions work in a monograph architecture and what components are typically needed and what we see in production today. From a high level, you can see how subscription operations are executed. So we're going to use the same example, but a client opens a persistent connection, sends a subscription to the server, specifying that each time uh, a new message is created, the client wants to know about the content of the username. When the server receives that subscription query, it registers that subscription and now monitors data changes. Uh, so when that event is triggered, in this example, an event results in a mutation, uh, the server executes a subscription query against the data that is uh, returned to make sure that it matches the requested data, the shape of it, and then immediately pushes the result through that same persistent connection. So as you can see, there are a lot of moving parts. So let's go over common components teams might use to build a real-time app using GraphQL subscriptions. Firstly, you obviously need a client application that supports GraphQL subscriptions. The client app is responsible in this case for sending subscription queries uh, to subscribe to specific events and listens for updates from the server. Uh, when those updates are delivered, the client app then updates the UI as needed. And in order for the client to receive those real-time updates, there needs to be a persistent connection between the client and the server. And this connection is established via a transport protocol, such as WebSockets or server sent events. And then you'll obviously need a GraphQL server that supports subscriptions. Uh, the server is responsible for handling incoming subscription queries and sets up event listeners to monitor data changes. So when there's a change, the server sends updates to all subscribed clients over the transport protocol. And of course, you'll already have your uh, data infrastructure. So the GraphQL server needs to be connected to wherever your data is coming from, uh, such as a database, an API, another service. Uh, these data sources are monitored by the server for any changes that are relevant to the subscribed clients. And many teams already have messaging systems, such as a PubSub, message queues, in order to maintain a stream of incoming messages that are then distributed across applications. It's important to note that the GraphQL spec is great because it doesn't 
give any recommendations or what transport protocols to use. It's very unopinionated. It lets you decide what's best for you. Um, but that being said, it does lack some guidance for a lot of enterprises that are looking for a lot more just reference architecture. Okay. So subscriptions are designed to handle situations where data is changing frequently and clients need to be notified of those changes as they happen, making them obviously a very useful tool for building real-time data applications or use cases. Uh, so what are the benefits of using GraphQL subscriptions specifically uh, when compared to other real-time strategies such as polling? Um, one of the biggest advantages of subscriptions is reduced latency. So since the GraphQL subscriptions allow the server to push updates directly to the clients as soon as the events take place, they ensure that clients are always up to date. So this is in contrast to polling, which is a pretty common technique in which clients constantly request data from a server in order to fetch new information. And because of that, polling introduces latency uh, as well as network overhead. As clients only receive updates when they send a request to the server. And depending on that polling interval, there can be vast delays between the update on the server happens and when the client actually fetches that new data and renders it on the screen. Um, subscriptions, in contrast, are event-driven and provide clients the latest data with little delay, making them a great option. Uh, similarly, subscriptions enable instant UI updates. So client applications, your mobile apps, your web applications can update their UI immediately as new data becomes available, uh, rather than requiring an update or a refreshed page. So for example, subscriptions ensure that users don't have to manually refresh the page and update to their app to see new messages in chat. That would be pretty useless. Uh, making the app more responsive, delivering a better UX. Subscriptions also facilitate efficient data delivery. So clients can specify exactly what data they want uh, to receive updates for, rather than requesting large objects over and over again, only with uh, when only a few of the objects fields have actually changed. So instead, the server can push only the changes to the particular fields directly to subscribe clients rather than all changes to all clients. Uh, this leads to faster updates, lower bandwidth usage. And lastly, subscriptions are fantastic for live data synchronizations, meaning the data displayed to users is always up to date. So this is really useful for collaborative applications where multiple concurrent users can be acting with the same data, as we mentioned with Google Docs or Figma. OK, so now that we've reviewed a lot of the context surrounding GraphQL subscriptions, how they relate to real-time features, let's talk about federated GraphQL subscriptions. Uh, for this section, I'll quickly go over a little bit of history about Palo's relationship with subscriptions. Since the Meteor days, many of the people here have been thinking about how to best stream in real-time updates to applications. In fact, Apollo was one of the main driving forces behind having subscriptions added to the GraphQL specification and produced several open source libraries that allowed Apollo users to leverage subscriptions with WebSockets to add real-time features to their apps. However, up until this release, GraphQL subscriptions weren't natively supported in a federated graph or super graph architecture. It's been one of our most requested features in the past years, and we want to be transparent about why we've taken the time to design it right. So why didn't we do this sooner? I'm sure many of you are thinking. There are many good reasons, but I want to focus on a few key problems that made this less straightforward than supporting standard GraphQL subscriptions in a monograph architecture. So first of all, uh, we wanted to solve real time in a federated graph thoughtfully and with a focus on enterprise readiness. And two, we needed to optimize the runtime. Uh, for the first point, a federated architecture introduces a whole set of problems that aren't prevalent uh, in a monograph architecture, namely choosing the right transport protocols. As we mentioned, GraphQL spec isn't super opinionated, so we wanted to give enterprises an actual reference that they could go ahead and implement that's been tested by us. Um, and Obviously, there's new levels of communication that need to happen. It's not just client to server. We now have client to router and then router to subgraphs. Um, we needed to be able to handle concurrent event delivery, as well as performing cross subgraph fetches to augment data before responding to the clients. All these concerns needed to be thoughtfully considered in order for us to feel proud of our solution. And there are a lot of varying ways to go about subscriptions. Um, because the GraphQL spec is not opinionated, uh, the lack of guidance on scaling, recommended transports, serialization, and overall implementation direction meant that we needed to carefully consider our own recommended approach. 
Uh, and most importantly, we needed to make sure that the runtime added no additional latency to event delivery. So that adding middle error provided more benefits, not less. So on a day-to-day -day basis, as many of you know, the runtime is responsible for building query plans, for routing requests to the proper subgraphs, and then assembling the results to be returned back to the client. And when it comes to subscriptions, the runtime is even more critical. It's responsible for receiving simultaneous subscription requests from various clients, uh, generating execution plans, routing the requests to the subgraphs that contribute the fields requested, as well as performing cross subgraph fetches to augment data before responding to the clients. All of this needs to be formed really, really quickly to ensure that the clients are updated in real time. You don't want any additional latency. In the meantime, we recommended a couple of different architectures while we were puzzling over how we can best do this. And businesses already went ahead and implemented many of these different architectures so they could use GraphQL subscriptions alongside their federated graph, uh, which I'll cover in the next few slides. All right, so one of the approaches which many of you might actually have in production today is keeping a separate subscription-enabled monolith um, that is handled separately completely from your super graph. So in this example, your queries and mutations come from the clients, they hit the router, they talk to your subgraphs behind the scenes. Um, but when subscriptions come in from the client, they go off to a completely different environment or graph. In this example, those subscription requests hit a subscription-enabled monolith here that's called reviews. Uh, this strategy works, but unfortunately it means that if you have a subscription that you've started and that subscription is going ahead and returning data and fields that are being returned by that subscription need to be tied into finding more data from the rest of the super graph, uh, you're going to have to do a lot of unnecessary round trips. So let's say in this case that reviews returns back a product ID that goes all the way back to the client. And let's say that client also needs the product SKU and that product SKU is handled by the product subgraph that's in your federated graph. To grab that SKU, the client needs to send another request back to your super graph, get that product data and bring it back. And obviously there is a lot of unnecessary round trips resulting in more latency and means that you have less of a real time experience for your product and for your end users. So while this technically works, um, it's not a fully integrated solution. It doesn't bring about those advantages of GraphQL subscriptions that we've been talking about, um, but it does technically work. Okay, and so then we designed the sidecar approach to help with that extra request requirement. So we don't wanna have the client have to reach back out to the super graph, get the extra data. So with this architecture, it's still pretty similar. Um, you still initiate the subscription from the client applications to your reviews monolith. And then that reviews monolith is getting those source events and is ready to send the subscription back uh, the server side will actually handle reaching out to the federated graph for extra data rather than sending everything back to the client and executing an entirely new query. Uh, so in this case, the reviews monolith reaches out to the super graph, fetches that product SKU, puts it all together, and then returns it back to the clients. So this, again, technically works. There are still a lot of extra communication pathways, but it's not as bad as the previous example. Um, the extra requests are happening in your backend environment, uh, which results in less round trips but queries and mutations are still going in a different request path altogether. So this workaround is actually in production for many customers today as it solves a real technical problem. However, in talking with many of these teams, it became clear that there was an even larger problem to be solved than just being able to get subscription operations integrated into the federated graph. For example, there's a lot of maintenance costs associated with this setup. Uh, teams need to ensure that the dedicated subscription services schema is always in sync with the federated graph, even though those could be handled by completely separate teams. Um, since the subscription service is a monograph, the team maintaining that needs to be able to work in one programming language, uh, which removes a lot of the benefits of the federated graph that supports multiple backend languages, lets the engineering teams decide for themselves. Um, touching on this as well, there's a lack of autonomy and ownership for backend developers. So the teams that own the subgraphs do not have ownership over the subscription types that are implemented in that sidecar service. So because of this, they aren't really empowered to make necessary changes to the federated graph without coordinating with the team maintaining the subscription service. Um, so that could be the app developers, that are, app developers that are usually maintaining that sub separate subscription sidecar. Um, so again, requiring lockstep coordination across the graph removes many of the advantages of choosing a federated architecture. And then lastly, platform teams lack insights reporting into the subscription service. Since it's built into the, uh, since it's not built into a federated graph, 
Um, platform teams don't have any visibility into how subscription operations are performing in Apollo Studio, which is not ideal for real-time use cases where performance is top of mind. Okay, so what kind of architecture do we have now, now that federated subscriptions are fully supported? First of all, there are less lines, uh, which was priority number one. Um, but this is a pretty simplistic architecture view. That was a joke, you all can laugh. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll go more in depth a little bit later about how this architecture works. But what I wanted to show is that subscriptions are now first class in the federated workflow. Um, clients can communicate with each other uh, or can communicate with the router or a fleet of routers. And when data is coming back from your subscription, if more data is needed in the response, the routers will continue to get everything needed from your subgraphs, assemble everything together, uh, return it all back to the clients in uh, a very, very quick time. And I'll go over some performance benchmarks, which is really exciting. Um, and the most important thing, the router is self-containing the execution of the query plan across all different operation types that goes to all the subgraphs, keeping things consistent. Okay, uh, quickly, I realize I'm going a little bit over. So let's talk a little bit more about our design goals for federated subscriptions. In Matt's keynote yesterday, he talked about treating the graph as a marketplace. So this is important framing for federated subscriptions because we spend a lot of time considering the three sides of the graph marketplace and what each side needs from the graph. So you have your app teams, the client developers, and they are the primary consumers of the exposed API schema and do not need to care about which subgraphs contribute which fields, um, but rather really need to focus on uh, being able to work with a single GraphQL API that hides all the implementation details. Um, their whole goal is just building better user experiences, better products. They do not want to care about who's doing what. Um, with that, we kept this guiding principle at the forefront of our work to enable self-service for app teams. So this means clients should be able to use a single operation to subscribe to real-time data that spans the entire graph as well as request additional fields to enrich the results. The second side of the marketplace is the service team side or your backend developers, your subgraph developers. Um, those developers are typically responsible for a particular service or a set of services uh, that exposes an interface for their consumers. Um, in the context of federated subscriptions, they need to be able to contribute subscription fields to the subscription root type. Um, whatever is relevant for their use cases that the client teams are requesting. They need to ensure that the implementations, um, any existing implementations for subscriptions can easily be brought into the federated graph. We didn't wanna make this horrible um, migration process since so many people already have those separate monoliths that are subscription enabled. We wanted to focus on being able to directly bring them into the graph. Uh, with that, the second guidance principle is uh, to provide flexibility and easy adoption paths for service teams. And then our third side of the graph marketplace, the platform team or the operators of the federated graph. They maintain the router, our super graph runtime, and they're responsible for the health and performance of the federated GraphQL API. So they need to ensure that best practices are followed, the architecture and transports are standardized, um, can meet the performance requirements. And so that was another guiding principle that uh, we can ensure performance and reliability for platform teams. Okay, so I'm qu quickly gonna go through these slides because I wanna get to the good stuff. But uh, our support for federated subscriptions allow clients to, to subscribe to events and request additional data that spans the entire graph. So we couldn't obviously limit subscription operations to the exact endpoint for the service that handles the real-time ed dates. We wanted to allow additional fields to be requested in order to fully take advantage of the graph. Um, so from a client's perspective, a subscription looks like a subscription in a monograph architecture, but all the events uh, can be subscribed to can come from distinct subgraphs. So app developers can request additional data from the graph to be included as part of the real-time updates, um, allows it to be more personalized. For example, a common use case we see is maybe like if you're a hotel, you might have, um, you might wanna give promotions based on a user's location. All this data might be just completely separate from each other, and you can bring that all in in one single operation. So our native design also enables you to take advantage of composition and publishing workflows. This is kind of separate from the whole sidecar approach. It's now all fully integrated. You can go ahead. Um, everything can be composed up into the super graph and exposed as part of the API schema. 
uh, further delivers on our separation of concerns, which is a really important part of Apollo Federation. So subgraphs are responsible for resolving the fields that they contribute to the subscription root type, and clients are never aware of any subgraph boundaries. So lockstep coordination is not required anymore. <laughs> okay, um, it's also built for performance scalable platform with full insights and observability into the performance of subscription operations. Uh, in the rest of the session, I'm going to zoom in more on the architecture and scalability side of the solution, as that's some of the most exciting portions of our work. Okay, so as I mentioned, I've touched on this a few times, but throughout our design and research efforts, we kept seeing that this went beyond just a technical problem. It was also an organizational problem. It was a big scalability problem. So as any system grows, whether in terms of data, whether in terms of volume, uh, traffic or architectural complexity, uh, the system needs to be able to like handle that growth. It needs to be scalable. So typically, a lot of the discussion surrounding scalability in GraphQL subscriptions for monographs is primarily focused on handling millions of connections to the server at once and managing stateful transports. Um, when it comes to a federated architecture, however, these scaling challenges are only a portion of what you need to consider. So two general areas you need to think about in a federated graph, uh, client-to-router communication and router-subgraph communication. So in client-to-router communication, our main concerns are handling a large amount of concurrent users, as well as being able to scale a subscription operation across the entire graph, uh, rather than relegating a subscription to the service that is responsible for those updates. We developed a new transport protocol for this communication path uh, called multi-part subscriptions, which communicates over HTTP, and we'll cover that a little bit. And for router to subgraph communication, you need to consider in term, uh, scale in terms of the number of disparate services that you might have, the volume of the data flowing through the system, and most significantly, ensuring the router can best manage a large number of connections to the subgraph servers. So you're going to handle communicating with the backends to serve up the requested updates to clients. You need to be sure that the router doesn't introduce any additional latencies to event delivery that could impact the responsiveness of real-time features. And for this level of communication, we support two transport options, WebSockets and a preview feature called HTTP callbacks. Okay, so as I mentioned, for client-to-router communication, uh, we introduced a new protocol. So, we were relentless in ensuring we could meet the most demanding concurrent client connection use cases. We've had com customers come to us and say, you need to be able to handle millions, two million client connections at once. Uh, so we partnered with them. We went and through a bunch of design sessions. We did some pressure testing and prove out that we can handle that kind of scale. So with that, let's talk about multi-part subscriptions. This was specifically designed for federated subscription support and it's based on the incremental delivery over HTTP specification. Um, which also leverages the same support that, that we did for at defer. Uh, subscription requests from clients to routers are transmitted over HTTP and events are streamed back to clients in a multi-chunked format. So this protocol provides a very similar end result as subscriptions managed by WebSockets or server send events without many of the downsides of WebSockets and SSC. And I'll be quick to cover those in a little bit. And to reduce work for app developers, we've implemented support for multi-part subscriptions and all of our Apollo clients web iOS Kotlin, and we've also developed some low-level library implementations for popular clients, such as Relay. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so uh, in the past, before Apollo Federation came along, we recommended using WebSockets. And so if you were using Apollo's open source libraries, we advocated that you should use WebSockets for real-time use cases. So our clients support WebSockets, there's all kinds of WebSocket plugin transport layers that can be used to talk to your subscription-enabled monograph behind the scenes. So when we started this initiative, we wanted to see, do we actually need full duplex communication for client-to-router communication? Um, wanted to know, are WebSockets really the best way forward when you're working with clients to the router? Uh, there are a lot of downsides to WebSockets, which I'm sure some of you have thought about before. Um, it can be a pain to use, most importantly, with off-the-shelf software or hardware. For example, with routers, load balancers, proxies, they often don't play well with WebSockets. And this brought us to considering SSE. Um, oh no, back. Okay, uh, SSE has a lot of advantages. It's all HTTP. Um, there are a few cons. There's limitations in the browser. Um, a big portion for us that was a, a big con was the inability to set custom headers. Um, that's a little bit hard for authentication. 
So we, we looked around and thought, we want the same thing that SSC provides, but we want to be able to do a little bit more. So why multi-part subscriptions? Um, when we were weighing these different trade-offs, these options, we realized we did also work for Ad Defer. We want to provide a similar client developer experience. Um, it would also be great to just move faster because we did all this work. So let's leverage that, extend it, um, and use multi-part subscriptions. So this spec that we base it upon, the incremental delivery over HTTP, is being solidified in the GraphQL steering community. Um, it's a fairly straightforward spec. It just specifies how you can use multi-part chunked responses and long live HTTP connections and what the boundary should look like. Um, the key takeaway here, though, is even if you have your own custom libraries or using client libraries that don't support this yet, uh, it's very, very straightforward to add support into your library for this, since it's essentially just HTTP requests with a few boundary specifications. Um, if you have more questions, please hit me up after the session. We can talk through. OK, quickly, for router to subgraph communication, our concerns mostly deal with ensuring the router can best manage opening and maintaining connections to subgraphs at a massive scale, as well as meeting performance requirements for low latency. So as I mentioned, we support WebSockets and HP callbacks. So why WebSockets? We just talked about all these cons of them, um, mainly because people are already using them. Like I said, a big requirement for this was making sure that people who already had existing uh, subscription implementations could go ahead and put a router on top and be able to just enable it through the router config and you have federated subscription support. That was more important than kind of telling people you should use this instead. So with that, we support both the GraphQL WS protocol and the deprecated subscriptions transport WS protocol. So you can go ahead, use this today. Um, yeah, so that's really exciting. Let's see, HTTP callbacks. A lot of you have come up about this. Um, I think Benjamin covered this also in the workshop. I'd be happy to talk about this more after as well. Uh, so what if you don't want to use WebSockets? Uh, what if you don't want to handle all that, all these persistent connections? Uh, we've provided HTTP callbacks as another transport option. Um, it's much, much lighter. You don't have to keep open these long with connections. Uh, it's currently in preview mode, but it's built into Apollo server. And since so, so many of you are really excited about this and have been asking about GA, uh, we're working on buttoning up all those and getting that out soon to you. Um, so with this approach, the router no longer needs to maintain a persistent connection. Uh, instead, the router sends an HTTP request to the subgraph responsible for handling subscription event delivery. Um, this request sends, uh, contains the subscription query information such as the callback URL, the unique subscription ID, and some parameters for authentication. And so as the events occur, the subgraph then notifies the callback URL with the requested subscription events. And as long as that subscription subgraph is configured to work with the callback URL approach, all source events will be sent to that URL. So this means that nothing really prevents you from sending events to the router in callback mode from another service other than the subgraph. So for example, the subgraph can just call an external API service, which is in charge of reading a Kafka topic, and then send events directly back to the callback URL. We also have a new mechanism for GD duplication. This is best for when you have lots and lots of clients that are requesting the same subscription. Um, so there's no, it's like a giant live chat. Everyone's requesting, connect me to the chat. I want to see new messages. Um, Deduplication basically deduplicates the request that's going from the router to the subgraph server. So if you have 1,000 clients that send the same subscription request over HTTP to a router instance, the router will only open a single connection against a subgraph server. So this is also really great for if you have a very load heavy subgraph server or very busy, um, you could just put the router on top um, and you could just reduce the amount of traffic that's going there. Okay, the fun part. So. I just want to call out some performance benchmarks, but a few caveats. These, this was conducted in like very, very perfect conditions. Um, we're using machines in the same network. There's going to be lower latency because of that. And our subgraphs are written in Rust. Still, we're really proud of these performance <laughs> metrics. Uh, these tests are using pass-through mode, so WebSockets, and they're measuring the latency between when an event was created on the subgraph and when we received that event on the client side. Uh, so it's important to note, however, that these are um, actually testing federated subscriptions. So it's doing that extra cross subgraph fetch. Uh, so for the first scenario, we are testing one event every 100 milliseconds, and we ramped up the attacks so that we constantly add new users until we reach 8,000 users of the number of client connections. 
Um, our second scenario tests the exact same scenario, but without using deduplication. So this means that there are 8,000 client connections as well as 8,000 open WebSocket connections to the subgraph server. And this mean, the mean latency on this is around one millisecond. Um, and lastly, we tested a higher rate with one event being sent every 10 milliseconds, with still 8,000 connections um, open. There's deduplication is enabled on this one. And the mean latency for the scenario is about 2.25 milliseconds, which is pretty, pretty great. Um, and this is why the Apollo router is a prerequisite for federated subscription support. Um, obviously, we, we really love the router. We put a ton of time into it, but we wouldn't do that if it wasn't absolutely necessary. Um, because the Apollo gateway is single threaded, uh, it couldn't handle the concurrent event delivery portion that's necessary. Um, that's a non-starter for real-time use cases. So the Apollo router is at the heart of our federated subscription uh, support. OK, thank you so much. Um, I would love, actually, for the teams that worked on this, so many uh, Apollo Studio teams, the router team, the client teams. Folks are here. There's people that are not here. But if you could stand up, I'd like to, to thank you for all your work. <laughs> Thank you. And although it's really fun talking about all the technical parts of this, it's also important to recognize that the whole point of this is to build more personalized, engaging experiences for our users. And we're really excited to see what you build. OK, thanks. <laughs>